Welcome to Hive Mind. This is The Sharp Edge. I'm here today to break down my latest report on Philip Haney, a patriot, a man of faith, and a whistleblower who was recently found shot. So let's get started. As a whistleblower with integrity to pursue the truth amidst persecution, Philip Haney was a faithful steward of a story much bigger than one man. He found himself in the crosshairs of an international criminal syndicate of Islamic terrorist organizations, Mexican cartels, and a former administration who concealed their gun running, drug trafficking, terrorism, and infiltration of America. Just 11 days after the attack of September 11th, 2001, the first director of the Office of Homeland Security was appointed to safeguard the country against terrorist threats. And a year later, Congress passed the Homeland Security Act in November of 2002. By March of 03, the Department of Homeland Security opened its doors. Now, as a charter member of this newly formed department, Philip Haney was there to see it all. He explained that he was brought on board as a counterterrorism specialist to follow the trail and find the nests. And that's exactly what Philip Haney did. And he did it very well. Texas Representative Louis Gomer described Philip Haney's service, recalling, um, The FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force Award is something he was presented in recognition of his exceptional contributions to interagency national security successes. He won numerous awards and commendations from his superiors for meticulously compiling information and producing actionable reports that led to the identification of hundreds of terrorists. He specialized in Islamic theology and the strategy and tactics of the global Islamic movement. From the Arizona Mafia to Homeland Security. Now, meanwhile, in Arizona, Janet Napolitano was appointed as the U.S. District Attorney of Arizona in 1993 by President Bill Clinton at that time. And then she went on to serve as the Attorney General of Arizona from 99 to 2003, and then later served as Governor of Arizona from 03 to 09. Now, by 2009, Janet Napolitano was appointed to the position of Secretary of Homeland Security by Barack Obama. This move was cheered by Senator McCain, who stated, I think she's highly qualified, and we as citizens of Arizona are very proud to have a border state governor and someone with her knowledge and expertise serving this very, very important and vital position adding, I think we all know that we face challenges from Islamic extremism throughout the world, and I believe she will do an outstanding job. Now, aside from Philip Haney, there's another whistleblower. His name is Jeffrey Peterson, and he was drawn into this web of what many describe as the Arizona Mafia. And Jeffrey Peterson was recently on the Quite Frankly podcast, and he stated this. When we see people start dropping like flies and there are mysterious deaths, and of course, for there are a great many people that just don't pay attention, For but for those of us who are, yeah. this, this always, um, the, the only thing that we can ever really assume about something like this is that this, they're trying to prevent something from coming out. Uh, they're trying to prevent somebody from cooperating with a uh, an, an authority that is not controlled. What are we looking at at this point? Because there's more and more busts. There's more and more attention being put on human trafficking. We know that there's all these types of links here. 
what are we, what are we seeing here with especially with the Muslim Brotherhood and um, Philip uh, Philip Haney? That that was his br- uh, main bread and butter there, and of course yeah. bringing up Janet Napolitano again. Yeah. So one of the things I did over the past year and a half, almost almost two years um, since I first came out on Twitter and started. Uh, disclosing information about my former group of friends from Arizona, which is Napolitano's group, um, as I always said, I'd be very careful about commenting on things I do know versus those I don't know. Um, and I did that to maintain credibility. Um, I, I always write in a bunch of my threads. I'd answer people's questions saying, I just don't know. And like people get mad at me. But um, anyways, uh, there is some really important stuff I do know. And that is I was around, as you know, um, to see Napolitano, I was, I was directly involved with these people. I was very close with her inner circle um, uh, as they got involved with the Mexican PRI political party as the relationship started unfolding. Um, and I was around them uh, for a few pivotal years where that was happening. I was around them before that, uh, but I was around them while that relationship was starting. So I saw a lot of it, very, very important things that translate directly into what's happening today. And I can see exactly what's happening. That is... Um, just as as is said in this thread, um, the most corrupt president in recent Mexican history, Carlos Salinas, is on the ropes. I mean, uh, we think he's on the ropes. With that guy, you never know, because there was already one reformer president in Mexico. His name was Vincente Fox, who kind of had the same approach as AMLO does right now. Like Vincente Fox said, I'm going to get rid of the corruption. No more liars, no more cheats. But then Fox turned out to be a Salinas puppet. He was controlled by Salinas himself, so it was all just a big, it was all just a big ruse. Um, we believe, like I believe, Amlo is really doing what he says he's doing. I think Salinas is on the ropes. Napolitano is uh, Salinas's front group in the United States. It's a it's a big deal. It's, it's a really big deal. Peterson went on to explain. How does that uh, that bond start getting um, start getting formed between the PRI and the the newly formed DHS? Because as Philip Haney even said in that uh, in that that Sean Hannity uh, 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 interview from 2016, he was a first generation member of the DHS. It's a very new agency. Yeah. So was it was the it always about drugs and human trafficking or is this something bigger because it seems much bigger than drugs and and human trafficking even at, even though that's bad as it is. Yeah, I don't know. Like there's so many smart researchers on Twitter. Um they can probably put it together as a group better than I can. All I know is what I saw. Um so I was there when Napolitano was leaving Arizona and going to DC to become Homeland Security Director. Um, I was I was with her inner circle of friends like when, when she got the phone call that she was going to do that. They were all excited. Um, many of them got appointed as agency directors. Uh, and uh, it, it was, uh, you're right, the agency was brand new. They were in some temporary headquarters that I actually went to in D.C. with my friends. Um, and they were like working out of cubicles. But it, it, it started, from my vantage point, it started kind of innocuous. It was just all about Arizona, Mexico relations, as far as I knew. And then they just started getting pulled in more and more by the money. They were super tempted by the money. They all wanted that easy money that was flowing from Mexico. And that's how they got into it. Another interesting piece of information is this recorded phone call that. Jeffrey Peterson had with another alleged member of the Arizona Mafia. And in this phone call, Jeffrey Peterson is speaking with Victor Flores about the Arizona Mafia and the death threats made against him. Listen. Some reporter, some somebody that actually is going to do some research is going to research whether or not uh, Marco... Uh, wants to assassinate you because he works for Salinas. Dennis wants you killed because he works for Salinas. Susie now is part of it. Janet Napolitano. All of these people are part of it. But she the she team, met with she met with the Salinas candidate Obrador himself. What, what difference does what difference does that make? So 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 what? You meet with somebody, so that makes you an assassin. No, Marco held out but, his you know, hand. Marco stood in front of me and said, "If you talk about these guys." 
first they kill you, then they kill your whole family. He told me that, Victor. I, I, God knows. I've got, he, I've, got, I've got friends in Phoenix that'll do that. It, it, and it may be true. I'm but, just, but, you know, again, again, I don't, I don't understand your strategy. You're going to go talk. See, now you're, you're talking all these, all these, uh, you're, go, you're going to Hannity? I mean, these are not credible people. They're, they're all a bunch of fucking liars like Trump and everybody else. You're going to totally go into the dark side so that, so that you can get all of this publicity. And, and, but ultimately, I think it's going to come back to bite you in the ass, Jeff. They are representing the no, no. Napolitano did meet uh, with that guy. The only one that's speculative what? is the purpose of Marco's port. And, and I'm willing to admit that I could be wrong about that. It's, it's speculation, and I've framed it as speculation. But the other things are totally factually correct. Why is the FBI in New York talking, interviewing me about Dennis if he's not involved? They say he's calling. They told me Dennis is calling the witnesses in the Nexium case and intimidating them. They told me that. That's not even me. So, Which case is that in New York? I, it's, I, I, it's, called, I that it's called Nexium. Dennis is representing a woman named Claire Bronfman, who was Emiliano Sabinas' business partner. I just, I just, I just read, that, I read that article because there's a guy named Rainier, right? And all that other bullshit. Yeah. That they were all part of... But Dennis, right? and, Dennis and I, is... I just, all, and they brought out Mark Sullivan, the, the Dennis's partner in GSIS, to testify in court for that guy. Now, much of the money flow from this relationship between the Arizona Mafia and the PRI, which Jeffrey Peterson referred to, presumably originated from cartels who likely used their PRI connections for drug trafficking operations through Arizona. And the former president affiliated with the Institutional Revolutionary Party, or the PRI, in Mexico is Carlos Salinas. He's regarded as by many as one of the most corrupt presidents in Mexican history. And he reportedly had family connections to drug smuggling, money laundering operations in the United States. And uh, several members of the PRI uh, which maintained political power in Mexico uh, for about 70 years until about 2000. They had direct connections with and received bribes from cartels, including the Zetas. And there's court documents from a case in Arizona that revealed this link between Hezbollah and the Zetas in their drug trafficking and money laundering operations. At this time, Hezbollah was growing in strength and numbers in Mexico and working with the cartels. Hezbollah is also known to have established a business relationship with the Oficina de Envigado, an offshoot of Pablo Escobar's Medellin cartel. A 2011 hearing uh, before the Subcommittee on Counterterrorism and Intelligence concluded that Hezbollah created an infrastructure for training, intelligence operations, and sleeper cells in Mexico while aiding the cartels in the construction of tunnels used for smuggling drugs and humans across the, the U.S. border. We have an abundance of evidence that has made it clear to Western intelligence communities that the Mexican cartels have for years been in league with the Islamic terrorist organization of Hezbollah. All of this was growing and proliferating while Janet Napolitano was in Arizona as an alleged member of the Arizona Mafia. In 2008, the DEA launched a campaign known as Project Cassandra, which compiled a trail of evidence to prove how Hezbollah's operations expanded from a military and political organization in the Middle East to a worldwide criminal enterprise. Project Cassandra's investigators had reason to believe that Hezbollah amassed more than a billion dollars per year from 
gun running, drug trafficking, money laundering, and a host of other criminal operations. Now, investigators tracked cocaine trafficking and money flow from Mexico to the United States with direct links to the state sponsor of Hezbollah, Iran, as well as the inner circle of Hezbollah itself. As Project Cassandra investigators began to zero in on their targets of this investigation, they repeatedly faced roadblocks by the Obama State Department. All requests by the investigators to prosecute, arrest, and file sanctions against these key players in the massive international trafficking operation were systematically rejected. Despite all the evidence, in 2010, Assistant to the President for Homeland Security, John Brennan, told a Washington conference that the Obama administration was seeking ways to, quote, build up more moderate elements of Hezbollah. Between 2009 and 2011, an operation known as Fast and Furious involved repeated transports of weapons and military equipment south of the border to the Sinaloa cartel. A contributor for The Hill recounted, M16s, AR-15s, AK-47s, 1911 Colt 45s, grenade launchers, grenades, Kevlar vests, and night vision goggles were all reported to the Justice Department Office of Inspector General in 2012 as having been a part of the weapons and equipment ran across the border as part of Fast and Furious. In a minimum of three separate occasions, weapons were transported through Arizona to Mexico, where the transporters met with both a U.S. national, and a person of Middle East descent to receive the load. Now, guns transported through the Fast and Furious operation have been connected to the death of Brian Terry, a U.S. Border Patrol agent in Arizona. But they may also have potentially been linked to the Paris attacks and a Garland, Texas attack, both in 2015. Judicial Watch reported on this, noting that the government lost track of most of the weapons, making it especially difficult for these weapons to be traced to specific attacks. However, in 2010, Fast and Furious linked weapons were in fact traced and intercepted by a Moroccan commander on their way to arm rebels in Algeria. Now, with Hezbollah's growing presence in Mexico, while Fast and Furious was in full swing, many of these untracked weapons may have ended up in the hands of these terrorists. In a 2013 congressional hearing, Representative Ted Poe remarked on it, stating, Do you remember Operation Fast and Furious? We still haven't gotten answers on that scandal. Adding, Of course, these guns ended up in the hands of terrorists, narco-terrorists. Is this the new foreign policy of the United States, international weapons trafficking? Apparently it was. According to a December 2018 complaint filed by whistleblower Jeffrey Peterson against members of the Arizona Mafia, Peterson alleges that he personally witnessed an alleged member of the Arizona Mafia, Dennis Burke, who was the former chief of staff to Janet Napolitano and was appointed to the position of U.S. Attorney for the District of Arizona by President Obama in 2009. And he made numerous statements, including possible admissions of misconduct and or culpability to Jeffrey Peterson, while Peterson and Burke were friends, regarding Burke's involvement in the Obama-era Fast and Furious arms trafficking scandal. Now, Burke resigned from his position in 2011 over leaking sensitive documents to the press for the purpose of undermining the integrity 
of an ATF whistleblower on the Fast and Furious operation, John Dodson. The mission to destroy America from within. Priorities of the U.S. State Department and DHS took this drastic turn in 2008. Philip Haney described the circulation of a touchstone document known as the Words Matter Memo, issued by the Department of Homeland Security, from which the monumental shift in counterterrorism policy arose. The document marked the launch of a new policy in which the DHS would no longer connect the dots between terrorist organizations and the religious groups from which they were affiliated. As the targeting of these religious groups would violate their civil liberties. Furthermore, the new policy set off a chain of actions by the department to purge a large database, which Philip Haney had tirelessly compiled. Another turning point for counterterrorism investigations came in November of 2008, when the largest terrorism trial in the history of the country, known as the Holy Land Foundation trial, determined that the Council on American Islamic Relations, CARE, the Islamic Society of North America, ISNA, and the North American Islamic Trust, NAIT, were unindicted co-conspirators and charges against five individuals who were found guilty of raising between 12 and $60 million for Hamas. These individuals and organizations were found to have irrefutable ties to the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas. The Holy Land Foundation trial fell on the month of the election of Barack Obama. Barack Obama, in our view, president-elect of the United States of America. Barack Obama is projected to be the next president of the United States of America. Barack Obama, 47 years old, will become the president-elect of the United States. Philip Haney remarked, a federal judge in Texas reasserted that these groups, CARE, ISNA, NAIT, etc., are still co-conspirators in the Holy Land trial, which takes us back to the HLF again, November of 2008. If you want to mark in your mind the point when our country went that way on counterterrorism, it's November of 2008. Why? because the Holy Land trial was concluded with 105 adopt, uh, indictments of five individuals for overt support of Hamas, somewhere between 12 and $60 million. And these groups that we keep hearing about, including most especially CARE, were tied to this network and proven in federal court irrefutably that they're connected to Hamas. So what did the administration do? That was the election month too, 2008. Instead of acting on this irrefutable evidence, they made the decision deliberately, intentionally, not to prosecute them, but to turn around and invite them into positions of authority and influence. And that is when I ran into the stone wall of this administration, so to speak. Senior level members of the Obama administration alleged to have been sympathetic to organizations tied to radical Islamic ideology, included the deputy chief of staff to Hillary Clinton's State Department, of course, Huma Abedin, who has Muslim Brotherhood ties and worked as a liaison between Hillary's State Department and the Clinton Foundation and this alleged pay-to-play scheme that gave foreign countries access to Clinton in exchange for donations to the foundation. And of course, senior advisor to President Obama, Valerie Jarrett, who played a key role in orchestrating the Iran deal. Private meetings were held in 2010 between these Muslim Brotherhood front groups, like CARE, and senior White House officials, including Valerie Jarrett, Janet Napolitano, and Eric Holder, 
to discuss their concerns regarding civil liberties, counterterrorism strategies, and national security. Known for taking meticulous notes in shorthand, during his tenure at the DHS, Philip Haney documented everything, including at least 150 meetings at the White House with Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas front organizations such as ISNA and CARE. These groups, ISNA, CARE, Islamic Society, of this, that, and the other, have, appear, have gone to at least 150 meetings in the White House that I documented during the course of my active duty career, because that's the kind of thing that I did. I told you I was an entomologist, right? Entomologists are the founding members of the Nerds Club, right? <laughs> what do nerds do? Write everything down, right? Well, that's what I did for a living before I became a counterterrorism spot specialist. I was a field research entomologist, the guy with the clipboard that was always writing everything down. And that's what I did in my new job, too. I wrote everything down and I kept it. I also, at the advice of my dad, during high school, took shorthand. <clears throat> I'll tell you how much of a nerd I was. There were 17 girls in the class and me, and I never went out on a date with any of them. <laughs> But I sure did learn shorthand. Philip Haney explained the dilemma that the Obama administration faced after taking on this new policy towards front organizations of Islamic extremism, stating this. The problem is, is that the counterterrorism specialists like myself did our job correctly and the information that we put into the system was actually working. It was producing law enforcement based actions. Well that's not very convenient when you're bringing those very same individuals into positions of influence and authority in the administration. Something's got to give. Then, just before the failed Christmas Day underwear bomber attack in November of 2009, Haney was ordered to delete or modify over 800 records of individuals connected to Hamas or Muslim Brotherhood from the law enforcement database. A congressional hearing over the failed bombing attempt ensued. Haney explained, while members of Congress grilled Obama administration officials, demanding why their subordinates were still failing to understand the intelligence they had gathered, I was being forced to delete and scrub the records. And I was well aware that, as a result, it was going to be vastly more difficult to connect the dots in the future, especially before an attack occurs. In 2012, Michelle Bachman and four members of Congress, including Louis Gomer, issued letters to the DNI, the DHS, the DOD, the DOJ, and the State Department with a stern warning regarding the infiltration of Muslim Brotherhood in the U.S. government. The letter began, as you may know, information has recently come to light that raises serious questions about Department of State policies and activities that appear to be a result of influence operations conducted by individuals and organizations associated with the Muslim Brotherhood. Given that the U.S. government has established in federal court that the Muslim Brotherhood's mission in the United States is destroying the Western civilization from within, a practice that Muslim brothers call civilization jihad. We believe that the apparent involvement of those with such ties raises serious security concerns that warrant your urgent attention. Bachman received harsh criticism over the letters by Arizona Senator John McCain and others. Now, McCain himself met with a known Al-Qaeda associate and a Libyan militia leader in 2011 during a trip to Benghazi and has been accused by Egyptian media as the godfather of the Muslim Brotherhood. Egyptian media personality Ahmed Musa 
remarked following the death of John McCain, stating, Today was John McCain's funeral, which the leaders of the criminal brotherhood in America have taken part in, and they performed the absentee funeral prayer for John McCain in Qatar, Turkey, USA, and Britain. Musa went on to state that McCain was the main supporter for the terrorist brotherhood. Senator McCain was the one who opened the Congress to the Brotherhood. He was the one who arranged the meetings and appointments and provided them with protection. The warnings by Bachman and others went largely ignored by the Obama administration, including the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, who stated before a congressional hearing the previous year that Muslim Brotherhood is an umbrella term for a variety of movements and that in Egypt, they're a very diverse group that is largely secular and has abstained from violence. The, the term Muslim Brotherhood is, a ver- is an umbrella term for a variety of movements. Right. Um, in, in the case of Egypt, a very uh, heterogeneous group, uh, largely secular, secular, which has eschewed violence and has decried uh, al-Qaeda as a, a perversion of Islam. Right. They have pursued uh, social uh, ends, uh, betterment of uh, the political order in Egypt, um, it's, and etc. And then in the a, other, a- Philip Haney described a second purge of information from the law enforcement database related to a case on which he worked and referred to this case as Tabliki Jamaat. Haney recalled this. This time they didn't come in and just modify the records like in the first great purge of 09. This time they came in and took the records completely out of the system. They bypassed protocol, got my social security to access my records and deleted them. Philip Haney saw something, said something, and paid the ultimate price. Following what Haney describes as the first great purge of records in November of 2009, Haney explained this. But then they had to maintain plausible deniability, and how are you going to do that? By going after the people who are contradicting the narrative and finding some way to discredit them and push them out of the law enforcement arena. And that's what they did. They knocked us off one by one. I was the first among the first, if not, but I also, by God's grace, was the one that survived the longest. I saw it all. During the remaining years of his service for the DHS, Haney was subjected to nine separate investigations designed to intimidate him, silence him, and ultimately remove him from his position. In one instance, Philip Haney was falsely accused of leaking information regarding a Saudi person of interest who was injured in the Boston Marathon bombing which led to the convening of a grand jury investigation against him. Haney was found innocent. And meanwhile, lawmakers grilled Janet Napolitano for the intelligence failures in sharing information between agencies that led to the Boston bombing attack, to which Napolitano admitted that the 2012 return of the Boston bomber to the United States was not flagged, stating... The travel in 2012 that you're, no. you're referring to. Um, uh, yes, uh, the uh, system pinged when he was uh, leaving the United States. Um, uh, by the time he returned, all investigations uh, had been... The matter had been closed. said, I think, to Senator Grassley that the older brother, the uh, suspect who was killed, when he left to go back to Russia in 2012, the system picked up his departure but did not pick up him coming back. Is that correct? That's my understanding, and I can give you the detail in a classified setting, but 
I think the salient fact there, Senator, is that the um, FBI uh, text alert on him at that point was more than a year old and had expired. Well, I, at the point I'm trying to make is after having talked to the FBI, they told me they had no knowledge of him leaving or coming back. The name was misspelled, so I would like to talk to you more about this case, how this man left, where he went, and when we say there was no broader plot here, I just don't know how in the world we know that at this early stage. Despite their best efforts to discredit Philip Haney, he persevered through it all, and he was exonerated in each of these investigations against him. In the final year of his service for the DHS, amidst the trials of yet another investigation, Philip Haney was stripped of his gun and isolated from his colleagues in the department. And despite the level of disrespect the man received from this department from which he served so honorably for so many years, Haney did not view this time in solitude as a loss. Instead, he used the period as a sabbatical in the remainder of his stint for the department Haney gathered, organized, and archived notes and documents that he'd meticulously kept over the years. And on July 31st, 2015, Philip Haney retired from the DHS. Days later, he met with the WND editor, Art Moore, and the pair immediately began working on the book, See Something, Say Nothing. This was an expose on Philip Haney's experience at the DHS, as well as on the former administration's attempt to obstruct the DHS and other agencies from connecting the dots among terrorist networks. Haney recalled this. We were writing the book in December. We were starting to put it together when the San Bernardino shootings happened. And it changed the whole structure of the book because it sadly proved the whole premise of the book. The Tablighi Jamaat case was shut down by Hillary Clinton and the State Department and my agency, Department of Homeland Security, Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, we call it CRCL. They came to the National Targeting Center in March of 2012 and said they had concerns about our focus on this group called Tablighi Jamaat. Once again, the departments that were designed to trace the networks of terrorist organizations they were unable to make the critical connections necessary to prevent an attack. Adding to the problem, Philip Haney explained this. But we're not allowed to make the, ask those questions anymore because Eric Holder's parting legacy in November of 2014 when he quietly went into the night as Attorney General was guidelines for federal law enforcement officers. He laid them on the table for us. We're not allowed to build cases based on affiliation with a, any religious group. So we're blinded and we're handcuffed. See, we, you can't build a case to probable cause if you're not allowed to make an association between the individual and the group, like in his case, it's called Tablighi Jamaat. Counterterrorism specialists were unable to draw connections to Syed Farouk's affiliation with the organization that Philip Haney had tracked three years prior. Haney claimed that the Tabliki Jamaat case, which had been deleted from the law enforcement database, would likely have put into place law enforcement actions against the terrorists, thereby preventing the San Bernardino incident from ever occurring. Then again, in June of 2016, Haney realized that the Orlando nightclub attack had chilling parallels to the San Bernardino attack, as the Orlando shooter was also associated with the Tablighi Jamaat case that he had worked during his time at the DHS. Haney explained, I was struck by the statement that there were two cases opened on Mateen in the past, and in both cases, they didn't find any evidence to charge him. When it took me three or four solid hours of work, 
but I found the direct link all the way from the Islamic Center of Fort Pierce all the way back to my case that I had worked on at the National Targeting Center. During a 2016 congressional hearing on radical Islam and terrorism, Haney illustrated the administration's countering violent extremism policy of separating terrorist attacks from their connection to Islamic groups. Haney explained this. In, in a few days after the Orlando shootings, that Attorney General Lynch was going to release partial transcript of Orlando 911 calls with all references to Islamic terrorism removed. That is a con condensation of what was actually happening behind the scenes with subject matter experts like myself who were sworn officers to protect our country from threat, both foreign and domestic. According to Texas Representative Louis Gomer, Haney had plans to release a new book in the spring of 2020. Gomer stated this. His book was going to name names of people that put this country at risk. Getting married April 4th. Finally going to be able to come back to the U.S. government and use his incredible talents and ability to spot danger for our country and stop it. And he ends up with a bullet in him. Unfortunately, all of Philip Haney's plans were stopped short on February 21st of 2020. Philip Haney was found dead next to his vehicle with a single gunshot wound. Early reports from the Amador County Sheriff's Department stated the cause of death appeared to be from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. The Amador County Sheriff's Department later released a letter on February 24th of 2020, which revised their earlier assessment, stating, unfortunately, there was misinformation immediately being put out that we have determined Mr. Haney's death to be a suicide. This is not the case. We are currently in the beginning phases of our investigation. And any final determination to the case and manner of Mr. Haney's death would be extremely premature and inappropriate. No determination will be made until all the evidence is examined and analyzed. Now, the letter went on to explain that the Amador County Sheriff's Department requested the assistance from the FBI in analyzing documents, a laptop, and phone records found at the scene and in Philip Haney's RV. Now, a couple days after Haney's death was reported, Glenn Beck reported that he was personally made aware of a thumb drive of important documents that Philip Haney carried on a necklace around his neck. Listen. And we spoke about God, and we spoke about the country, and that few people had the opportunity to do what he did. And that he felt very alone, but he wasn't. The man knew who he was, knew what time it was, and knew who God was. He was a deeply spiritual man. And a man who understood history and understood his place in it. No man who speaks like Philip Haney did goes off and kills himself. I'd like to ask the police that found his body and deemed it a suicide if he had a thumb drive around his neck. I hadn't seen Phil for probably a year, maybe two years. But I'd say hi to him. 
I'd hug him and I'd slap him on the chest. He knew what that meant. I was feeling the thumb drive because there were documents that he kept around his neck. The Amador County Sheriff's Coroner's Office has put out this statement as well. This concerns the death of Philip Haney, which occurred on Friday uh, the 21st uh, in our county. Uh, Mr. Haney was found uh, next to his vehicle uh, with what appeared to be a single gunshot wound. Uh, our responding officers uh, assessed the scene based on the totality of information that they had at the time um, and said that it apparently was a self-inflicted gunshot wound. No determination has been made as the actual cause of his death at this point. Um, I must say that the role of the coroner in California is to determine the cause and manner of any death of this type, and that's exactly what we're doing. The initial assessment by the deputies arriving on the scene and their supervisor is the start of an investigation. It is not the end, and we have not made any conclusions as to the cause and manner of death. We have to wait until the investigation is completed. It's going to be lengthy. It's going to take time. And in order to assist us in that effort, we have called upon resources of some regional law enforcement partners. First and foremost is the Federal Bureau of Investigation, who will be helping us analyze and process evidence taken from Mr. Haney's vehicle, his recreational vehicle that he was living in at the time, some documents, cell phone, laptop computer, firearm, and other information that we have gathered, and to assess, evaluate, and determine if there's any value to this investigation out of those items. The second partner that we've called upon is one that we rely upon in forensic autopsies on a regular basis, and that is the Sacramento County Coroner's Office, who will be conducting a forensic autopsy. As I said earlier, this is an ongoing, active investigation. We are not able to release detailed information as much as the inquiries that we're receiving would like. We are receiving information inquiries nationally on this particular case because of Mr. Haney's uh, profession and occupation. We are taking everything into consideration. This will not be completed. We will not come to a determination as to cause and manner of death until all, all evidence has been examined, has been processed, and we have been able to evaluate that along with our investigation. I also will add that this remains an Amador County Sheriff's Office investigation. The FBI, the Sacramento Coroner's Office, are assisting us in our efforts to bring this matter to a conclusion. Again, this is going to be a lengthy process. All of the information and evidence that have been collected needs to be analyzed, both at, in Washington, D.C. at the FBI headquarters, as well as locally. So we need to keep that in mind as this moves forward. We'll provide updates as we can, but again, specifics and details until we reach our conclusion will not be made. I will also take this opportunity to extend our condolences to Mr. Haney's family and friends, uh, many of whom have suffered as a result of this loss. It is our charge and our duty to come to the reason, the cause, the manner for his death. And that's what we intend to do. Thank you very much. The death of Philip Haney appears to be yet another attempt to silence him and his message. As a whistleblower with the integrity to pursue the truth amidst persecution, Philip Haney found himself in the crosshairs of an international criminal syndicate of Islamic terrorist organizations, Mexican cartels, and a former administration who concealed their gun running drug trafficking, terrorism, and infiltration of America. Philip Haney knew the dangers he faced in speaking out, but he was a man of faith who felt he was tasked to carry on this mission. This is what he said. Because I'm a steward of the story. Mm -hmm. It's not my story, it's not about me. The story is about our country. Yes. It's a great honor to be the steward of the story, but it also came with a great price. Philip Haney paid the ultimate price in his faithfulness to God and his country. 
And despite their best efforts to silence him, Philip Haney's message lives on. That concludes this report on Philip Haney, the faithful steward. Thanks for listening. Please like, share, subscribe, and hit that bell. We'll see you back next time right here on Hive Mind. <laughs>